Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'd like to present part five of my series on the selected gross pathology of the liver and biliary tree, and part five is going to talk about helminth diseases, or diseases that are caused by cestodes, nematodes, and trematodes within the liver and a variety of species. And as I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those individuals and colleagues who have provided me images, either through online collections or through direct means, which have allowed me to put these lectures together. Thank you all so much. Our first image is an absolutely beautiful image, which is available in Noah's archive, and is a hydatid cyst. Hydatid cyst is the intermediate form, which is found in the intermediate host, of a kinococcus granulosus. The definitive host is a dog, and these are small cestodes, which are present in the small intestine. Don't cause really much of a problem. When the infected dog passes the eggs, they're ingested by a wide range of intermediate hosts, usually herbivores, often sheep, uh, sometimes cattle, horses, but just about any animal can be an intermediate host, including humans, which are considered an aberrant and dead-end host. And rodents are often infected. So the infected vonkosphere hatches, it migrates to the intestinal wall, and either goes directly into the tissues or very often goes into the portal circulation. And because it goes into the portal circulation, you'll see most of the cysts deposited either in the liver or if it bypasses the liver, it keeps going in the bloodstream, often in the lungs. These are great lesions. The cysts uh, are extremely hardy. They have a thick wall and are surrounded by fibrous connective tissue. They last for a long time. If you find this in a camel that's been dead in the middle of the Sahara Desert for weeks, the cysts, the hydatid cysts, will still be in pretty good shape. That's how hardy they are. Now here's an older picture of one which shows what you normally find within a viable cyst and when you cut into it you will see all of these little protoscolices. These protoscolices each represent one immature tapeworm so you can see that a dog which eats the carcass of an infected sheep and gets into one of these will get hundreds of viable new tapeworms and the cycle will continue. Usually the hydatid cysts are seen in the liver and the lung, but they can actually end up anywhere because they get into the bloodstream. So you can also see them rarely in aberrant tissues like the brain, the heart, the bone, or the subcutaneous tissue. Usually they're solitary, but sometimes you will see multiple hydatid cysts within infected individuals. There is a related parasite uh, known as Echinococcus multilocularis, which we're going to look at when we get to the lectures on diseases of the mesentery because they are primarily seen within the abdomen. We'll also look at a number of other tapeworms that tend to reside in the abdomen or on the mesentery or serosa of visceral organs of a wide range of animals because today we're concentrating on the ones that really affect the liver. A lot of helminth parasites migrate through the liver. In the first lecture of this series where we covered the very common diseases of the liver, we talked about milk spots in pigs, which are the residuum of uh, Ascarosum or Stephanurs dentatus as it migrates through the liver. Sometimes you will see various uh, uh, evidence of the passage of different types of parasites through the liver, and this is the liver of a sheep. Uh, the lesion shows up very nicely because there's a lot of fat in this liver, and you can see these uh, hemorrhagic tracts and sometimes these whitish tracts, which represent previous migrations of serial passages of another system. To, uh, another cesto, Cystocircus ovis, which has a, a sheep-dog cycle. Unlike a kind of coccus, these are on their way to their final resting place in the intermediate host. The muscles, especially the skeletal muscles, including the active masseter muscles, uh, the diaphragm, and even the heart, they tend to go toward the muscles with a high metabolic activity. 
Um, they're often detected at slaughter, and the disease is known as sheep measles. But this is just a really nice picture of the tracks that you might see as part of their migration. Sometimes there will be migratory tracks for the liver of various parasites. You don't see any gross lesions, but if you cut in a section, you may see areas of fibrous connective tissue, mineral, and some remaining macrophages and eosinophils, and that's good histologic evidence that parasites have passed through that section of liver that you're looking at. Here's another cystoparasite of the liver that we don't see anymore, but has gained fame among pathologists because of its association with sarcomas. This is Cystocircus fascialaris. Some people call it Cystocircus teneiformis. It is the uh, Cystocircus form of tenia teneiformis, whose definitive host is the cat. And this, the presence of these Cystocerci in the liver suggests that your food has been contaminated by cat feces, and somewhere along the line, the food security for your laboratory isn't all that good. We don't see it much anymore. But the interesting thing about this particular Cystocercus and long-standing infections it has been purported to result in the development of fibrosarcomas within the liver. Another not uncommon uh, parasite of the liver of ruminants are trematodes, or liver flukes. The majority of these flukes live within the bile ducts and result in marked fibrosis to the point that you can trace the bile ducts from the surface of the liver. The presence of the adult flukes over a long period of time results in proliferation of fibrous connective tissue around the bile ducts. Most of these don't cause too many problems. Okay, so the one we're looking at here is fasciola hepatica an inhabitant of the bile duct, which tends to cause more problems with its migration as the immature flukes, when it sets off various bacterial diseases in the liver of ruminants, which we've already talked about in earlier lectures, such as Clostridium hemolyticum and Clostridium novii. Their migration results in the ischemia needed for these clostridial bacteria to proliferate and results often in the death of the animal. But the parasite itself doesn't cause too much problem. Here's a really nice picture of a cross section of a bile duct, and you can see the concentric fibrosis, the mild proliferation of the lining epithelium, and the presence of the trematode within the duct itself. Fasciolopatica is probably the most common, the most important fluke of the liver of domestic animals, and it's also seen not only in the bile ducts, but also in the gallbladder of cattle, sheep, goats, and horses as well. Like many other trematodes, Fasciolopatica is hermaphroditic, and only one fluke can establish an infection in an animal. They're also very long-lived. They live up to 11 years, and they may produce up to 20,000 eggs per day. Flukes are most often seen in sort of swampy areas because one of the intermediate hosts that's required for uh, the, their development is a snail. In a wet environment, the eggs that are passed by the ruminant host will settle and will develop into mericidium, which penetrate the body of the snail, which mature in the snail, and then eventually, four to seven weeks after penetration, they'll leave the body of the snail and settle onto grass where they'll be picked up by the next ruminant host. When they get into the ruminant host, the metasarcaria, uh, they Exist, or they come out of their cyst in the duodenum and they penetrate the intestinal wall and within four to six days they're already through the capsule of the liver into the parenchyma migrating through the parenchyma till eventually they will get into the bile ducts once inside the bile ducts the infection becomes patent the animal causes chronic changes in the morphology of the duct 
and it can be passed on to other hosts. Just one more picture of a cross section of liver from an ox, and you can see the prominence of the bile ducts, which suggests the presence of biliary flukes. Just a note on the infection of horses. Um, it does happen. It varies from uh, rare to fairly common. In, uh, in Europe, it goes anywhere from 3 to 4%. In Central Europe, to in areas which are a little bit wet, like Ireland and parts of the United Kingdom, infection may be up to 75% of horses. Infection. Horses tend to be uh, much less severe than in ruminants because horses tend to mount an immunologic response to the presence of the immature flukes over time. So you only see a couple of flukes with infected horses. Okay, let's look at a, another fluke that people get all sorts of excited about because it migrates within the liver parenchyma. Fasciloides magna is the largest liver fluke. And it's the liver fluke of white-tailed deer, which generally doesn't cause any problem in white-tailed deer. But of course, when it gets into other ruminants, because it is unrestricted by the bile ducts and it migrates directly through the parenchyma, it can cause all sorts of problems. A few migrating flukes are enough to kill a sheep. Cattle tend to be able to, uh, to sustain a larger infection, but remember, as we said before, this type of migration um, and destruction of the liver, this is the black pigment that's associated with the uh, migration of the fluke itself. It ingests blood and some tissue fluids and probably some, some smushed up liver cells, and it leaves what people call fluke pigment or fluke exhaust, which is the broken down hemoglobin. It has a blackish color. But remember in cattle, because they've already put down the spores of Clostridium novii or Clostridium hemolyticum, it can set off a much worse problem in the form of bacillary hemoglobinuria or Black's disease. Occasionally, you will see it in other species, including large ruminants, exotic hoofstock, and the occasional horse. In cattle, which are primarily the, the species affected, these adults are eventually encapsulated in fibrous connective tissue, cease migration, and then the body will wall it off and kill it. Although it is a parasite of white-tailed deer, this could be a real problem if farm deer, such as red deer or sika deer, are infected. And here's a nice picture of a cross-section of that liver, and you can see the black tracks resulting from migration, cross-sections of a number of fasciloides magna. Look how big these trematodes are. And then the hepatocytes in proximity to migration tracts or to the parasites themselves are fat laden because remember you're going to have some ischemia in relation to the migration tracts because of fibrosis and these hepatocytes probably aren't getting enough oxygen sick hepatocytes tend to uh, tend to accumulate fat a portion of this is probably also going to be fibrous connective tissue as well. So a very nice illustrative uh, picture of the damage that fasciloides magna can do with its migration. And then just an absolutely wonderful picture of fasciloides magna. I believe that this is a lot of this is oviduct right here and you can see why these animals are producing up to 20 thousand uh, eggs per day. Tremendous proliferation of eggs. They leave them behind as they migrate and uh, you can see them in the sections that you take from these animals as well. Let's move on to a third uh, fluke of the liver of ruminants. This is a great picture, uh, a number of pictures 
from Dr. Panayotis Lukopoulos, who now is working in Australia. And uh, this shows the biliary fibrosis, a fibrosis of bile ducts, which is caused by another introductal parasite, the lancet fluke, or dicrocelium dendriticum. Usually the infections are pretty mild. This is a significant infection here, resulting in extensive fibrosis of biliary ducts. So you can see the tortuous uh, fibrous ducts here from the surface of the liver. This particular parasite can also affect pancreatic ducts as well and will live in the gallbladder and the large ducts. And here's a really nice picture from Dr. Samuel Sharp of the adult lancet flukes. These flukes have an amazing life cycle. They do uh, usually pop up in wet areas and snails are required to uh, uh, as part of the life cycle, but they also will infect ants. The metasocaria will infect the uh, ant, live in the abdomen, and very interestingly, will cause a change in the behavior of the ant. And so the ant will work you know, very hard as a, a productive member of the colony during the day. And then as the day starts to cool, it becomes almost a zombie. And it walks up to the top of the blade, the nearby blade of grass, the very, you know, very top, which is most likely for it to get eaten by a ruminant. And it will cling on to the top of this blade of the grass by its mandibles and just sort of hang there until the next day where it shakes it off if it hasn't been eaten by, you know, a cow or a sheep and goes back out uh, to the colony to work until the following night. Just an amazing adaptation uh, by this particular parasite uh, to enable the life cycle to continue. One more picture of uh, the trematodes within the gallbladder of the, uh, uh, of the sheep host and the fibrosing pericholangitis that you see in affected animals. If you work uh, with aquatic mammals, especially otters or, you know, even fish. Trematodes are extremely common in the biliary tract. They all seem to have them. I don't remember all the names of the different ones, but they're very common in aquatic animals as well. Okay, um, this is a great picture by, by my friend Dr. Mike Garner from Northwest Zoopath, and it is a liver from a zoo rodent. I believe this was a prairie dog. And you can see that there is really some significant color change here. All these white areas are large areas of fibrosis, eosinophilic inflammation, and tremendous numbers of eggs due to infection by collodium hepaticum, which most of us remember as Capillaria hepatica. This, this is a, an aphasmid nematode that mainly infects rodents and lagomorphs, but occasionally you'll see it in other vertebrates, such as dogs or even primates, including humans. Rats are the most common uh, host for this particular parasite. And it is the only known nematode with a direct life cycle requiring death of the host to be completed. And when we say it requires the death of the host, the, uh, the migrating, the, well, okay, when the animal ingests, uh, the, the rodent host ingests the eggs of capillary hepatica, they will hatch out in the intestine. And the immature nematodes will migrate through the liver, eventually becoming uh, uh, adults within the hepatic parenchyma. And they continue to migrate through the parenchyma, causing extensive fibrosis. And during the migration, uh, the adult females will lay eggs. Eventually, the females and the males will die, and there'll be no worms, but the liver will be absolutely full of infective eggs. But because they're never passed into the bile and out into the environment, okay, the only way that infection is passed on is through the death of this 
host ingestion by another host or ingestion of the eggs as the body decomposes and goes into the soil. Predators may be infected or may simply be peritonic hosts, which will digest the dead animal and will pass the infected eggs into the soil in their feces. Something you see histologically in these cases is a condition known as septal fibrosis. It's a type of bridging fibrosis which bridges from portal tracts to portal tracts. So some researchers think that this is an excellent model, somewhat odd, but an excellent model for the uh, progression of hepatic fibrosis in people. It is certainly not a difficult histologic diagnosis by the sheer massive numbers of bipolar eggs which are present within the hepatic parenchyma in the absence of any viable nematodes. Okay, let's look at one more uh, parasite which is really a problem in humans and we see it in non-human primates. They are the animal models for this. You can see that the liver from this chimpanzee is markedly swollen, it is discolored, it's contracted due to the presence of severe fibrosis and a little bit of macronodular regeneration. And this is uh, infection with uh, the blood fluke, schistosoma mansoni. Schistosoma mansoni will affect uh, primates uh, and a, a couple of other species besides chimpanzees, including baboons and squirrel monkeys and African green monkeys. And normally, the adult schistosomes will live in the portal veins, resulting sometimes in venous thrombosis, but they tend to pass their eggs, and they get caught up in the, into the portal veins, and they migrate, and they often will get stuck in the uh, small branches of the portal veins in portal triads, causing sort of an intermill proliferation, thrombosis, and granulomatous inflammation, progressing to marked hepatic fibrosis. Like many other parasitic trematodes, they do require a snail intermediate host. But unlike some of the other trematodes, they don't have to be ingested. They can be ingested or they can even penetrate the skin to infect the definitive host. So the adults live in the mesenteric and portal vasculature and the presence of the eggs stimulates marked granulomous inflammation, and eventually portal fibrosis in affected individuals. Okay, well, we've looked at a number of important uh, helminth parasites of the liver. Certainly, there are many more out there that probably bear mentioning, but we don't either have the time or I don't have good pictures of them. So just remember that there are quite a number of both tapeworms, flukes, and nematodes that will cause uh, damage uh, in various animal species. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture, and we'll see you for the next lecture, which will cover toxicologic and nutritional diseases of the liver in domestic animal species. Thanks for your time, and have a great day.